Hi, I'm Howard Marks, and this is How to Think About Risk. So now let me try in a slightly philosophical sense to reflect to you how I think about risk, uh, how I think you might consider risk through four basic points. Number one, there was a professor at the London Business School who said, risk means more things can happen than will happen. For most events that lie in the future, there are a number of things that could occur. We don't know which one it will be. That's where the risk comes in. More things can happen than will happen. Number two, as a result of that, the future should be viewed not as a fixed outcome that's destined to happen and capable of being predicted, but as a range of possibilities, and hopefully because you have some insight into their respective likelihoods as a probability distribution. The most likely, the less likely, the unlikely but not impossible. Number three, it's important to accept that even when you know the probabilities, that doesn't mean you know what's going to happen. Uh, this is uh, something that I think many people fail to grasp. I play a lot of backgammon, and a lot of my examples uh, on risk and uncertainty uh, come from the game of backgammon, which is played with a pair of dice. And when you roll your pair of dice, we know exactly in advance what the probabilities are. Each die has six sides. There are 36 possible combinations of the six sides. We know how many of them, for example, will add up to seven. And seven is the most likely single outcome. One, six, two, five, three, four, four, three, five, two, six, one. There are six possibilities out of the 36 that will give you a seven. That's the most likely outcome. Uh, six out of 36, that's 16.7% probability. Now, what if instead you want to know about a six? Well, with the six, there are five possibilities. Five possibilities out of 36, that's a little less than a seventh. And then when you get down to uh, the number two, there's only one, 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 one out of 36. And for the number 12, only one, six, six one out of 36. Both of those are about a 3% probability of happening. So we know exactly what the probability distribution uh, looks like. Uh, uh, we know what's the most likely, the other likely possibilities, and the unlikely possibilities. We still don't know what's going to happen. So knowing the probabilities does not eliminate the uncertainty. I work with a professor at Wharton named Chris Getze. And the way he put it to me one time, we live in the sample not the universe. In other words, the universe statistics, like I just explained for the dice, determine the things that could happen and maybe their possibility. But we live in the sample. We only have one outcome, and therein lies the uncertainty. A great way to think about this is on Super Bowl morning in 2016, they had a uh, former football player on, uh, and he said, what I thought was one of the smartest things about uh, probability I had ever heard. This game was Denver versus Carolina, and Carolina was heavily favored, and they asked him who he thought would win. And he said the following, Carolina wins eight times out of 10. This could be one of the two. Now, this gives you the, un the essence of probability and the essence of risk. Uh, most people, if they hear that something's 80% likely to happen, they say, well, then I guess we know what's going to happen. I guess they might as well not play the game. No, 80% likely means that the other team should win one game out of five. So we have to play the game because we have to figure out which game this will be. And that leads to number four. I take Dimson's statement that uh, risk means more things can happen than will happen, and I turn it over. Even though many things can happen, only one will. Thus, the expected value, the probability weighted average of the possible outcomes, which is the basis on which people make uh, many decisions, it can be irrelevant. They take each outcome, they multiply it by the probability, 
they add them up and they get the expected outcome. And many people will say, well, we're going to take the course of action that has the highest expected value. But sometimes the expected value isn't even among the possibilities. Now, this sounds highly counterintuitive, but think about this. Let's consider a course of action which has four possible outcomes, two, four, six, and eight. And let's say that we conclude that each of those four is equally likely to happen. So what we do is we take each one, two, four, six, eight, we multiply it by 25%, the possibility of it happening, and we add it together. And in this case, the, the expected value of two, four, six, eight is five. But five can't happen. Remember, I said the outcomes can be two, four, six, and eight. So it, it, I'm, I'm only going through this to show you the possible fallacy of expected value. There's another problem with expected value because even though course of action A can have a higher expected value than course of action B, course of action A may include some possibilities that you just can't live with. Maybe course of action A uh, includes some remote possibility that you lose all your money. And even though it's highly unlikely, you, you may say, I just don't want to contemplate that. So you don't take A, you take B instead, which has a slightly lower expected value. Uh, but without the risk of ruin. Mm -hmm.